Really? I'm going to follow that? Let me give you a little background here that's kind of different to what I thought about. I was born in 39, so I'm older than most of you and younger than a few. But I played war games, okay? So I was kind of brought up with World War II. And when the Korean War came along, my father had a young man work for him who was 19, and he went to Korea and didn't come back. So from early on, I kind of knew something was wrong. And I wasn't quite sure yet. I was still pretty young. I ended up in the military in Texas in the early 60s. And when I came back from there, I knew something was wrong, and I knew that I had to do something about it. I wasn't quite sure what, but I knew that I had to do something about it. So looking around in 1965, I joined the John Birch Society. That's 52 years ago. Now that's more years than many of you here have been on the earth, right? Six years later, I was on a field staff for the John Birch Society as a coordinator. A couple months after that, I went north of Ogden to a place called Smith and Edwards. I met this guy named Bert Smith. It's 45 years ago. <laughs> what a great soul. Truly, he was. This guy's 96 years old and still working on it. He's still working on it, right? He's doing things, working, working, working on what he sees the problem is. He never quit. He never quit, never thought about quitting. And so at that convention when I, and hardly anybody comes when I do that. And then about six months later, I get a phone call, maybe it's, maybe it's you, I don't know, someone called and said, Bert died, and we're, we'll have to do something else, because I sent a note out for this breakfast, and, and there was Kathy going to speak. He said, well, Kathy won't speak, and I said, nah, you don't understand Kathy, she will speak. And she did. Two days later, this young lady, I can call you young, right? It's easy. <laughs> she spoke, and a wonderful delivery she made to remind us of who Bert Smith was. Now, in my 52 years of activity, I've talked to a lot of people, and I've been harassed by professionals. It's really interesting of the people you talk with about the problems that we have, and you probably have found this, Mr. Eidsmo, most don't want to know about it. And they don't want to do anything. Why? I don't have the time. Or I'm too busy. I don't have any money. All of us only have three things. We have time, or influence, and our money. Depends on what you want to do with those things. Bert never tired. He kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Let me ask you a question. Why are you here? What are you doing here? I don't like some of the Eagle Form folks here. Why are you here? And what are you going to do tomorrow and next week and next month? Brigham Young said years ago, he said, you expect to pick apples off of trees you never planted. Isn't that not how many of our friends are? We want to pick apples off of the tree of freedom and do nothing to fertilize the ground, to prune the tree. Even to, all we want to do is pick the fruit. 
So many people I talk with think that God's going to solve this problem for them. And I say, why would he do that? And when's he going to start? Would it not be true that God helps those who help themselves? Supposing you, you go home today and your house is on fire. Kind of ugly thought, right? Suppose your house is on fire. Can you find me a scripture that says you're supposed to put the fire out? There aren't any. There aren't any. Well, what would you do? It's, it's really interesting how many people think that the Lord's going to solve this problem for them. For them. While they do nothing. Why do we get to that point? Where we think that we can do nothing and just continue to pick off the apples off the tree of freedom. So Kathy, like so many other wonderful ladies here and men, some of you I've known for a long time, you have to be commended for continuing the work. And I have to ask myself, okay, I've been 52 years, why am I still doing this? And I don't know. I don't know. Something drives you, am I right? Something drives you pushes you and pushes you and pushes you. Now that you don't know where to turn in your resignation slip, right? Where do you do that? <laughs> now by tomorrow, most of us will have forgotten almost everything we've heard today. 80% of what we hear today will be gone tomorrow, right? You just think of all the things you've heard already. How much can you possibly remember? So to study, the DVDs will be available, right? To get that, to review that. It's so important that we remember and that we use. So I asked you the question, why are you here? I would hope that the reason we are all here is so that we may become better able to develop to preserve, to teach the principles that what we have experienced for these many years can be preserved. And I wrote a thing not too long ago about how do I want to be remembered? Sort of the title of my talk, it's really how do you want to be remembered? Robert Welch, the founder of the John Birch Society, said years ago, he said, we need more pullers at the oars not riders in the boat. I would like to be remembered as a puller at the oars, not a rider in the boat. Now, Bert Smith, he probably pulled on two oars. And he just kept pulling and pulling and pulling. Now, some of the things you've heard here today you might not agree with. The difficulty is that all of us believe things that aren't true. Because that's what we've been taught. And it's hard for us as individuals because our pride gets in the road. How do I admit that maybe I've been wrong? And what if, what if I'm wrong? You have these discussions with people you know, where you don't agree. Well, we both can't be right, so someone's wrong. It's hard to look at what you think, what you believe. In fact, for so many years, and think, well, what if I am wrong? What if I am wrong? Do I have the time to keep going down this road if I am wrong? What kind of waste is that? So to be able to look at yourself introspectively and say, okay, is what I believe about this, am I right or am I wrong? And if you're wrong, be willing to change. I don't know about you, but I don't have the time to labor in an area where I'm wrong. And I'm not concerned about being right, about doing what is right.
You remember Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, these are the days that try men's souls. Talk about the summer soldier. And what, is this? what is that the quote here? Sunshine patriot and the summer soldier. The question would be, which one am I? Which one are you? And what we do tomorrow, next week, next month. Now, we need more pullers at the oars. I look at the average age here, and there are not enough young people here. There aren't. Sooner or later, maybe I've got 20 years left, sooner or later, a lot of us are going to be gone. Well, who's going to be sitting in those chairs? We need to find more pullers at the oars. And unhappily, as we look at the the world in which we live now, it doesn't speak very well for the future, does it? Let me ask you this question. Why were the Israelites given the Ten Commandments? Why were they given the Ten Commandments? They'd been under the, under the Egyptian and Pharaoh for, what, generations? There were about four million of them left and went to the desert, and they get the Ten Commandments. Why? What did the Ten Commandments represent? I, I must admit, I'm not sure I have the answer, because I hadn't thought about this. So the other day I was thinking, wait a minute, why the Ten Commandments? What was the purpose for the Ten Commandments? What are they? Know the God before me. Don't lie, cheat, steal, kill. Don't be adulterous. Don't covet, right? What do those tenets represent? An orderly society. They were now without law, except for Moses. But those commandments represented the tool by which civilization would continue. Now transfer that to today. What does the family represent? Why is the family important? Your families. Why is it important? The family is a primary tool by which your principles or principles of society, civilization, will be transferred to the next generation. That's where we teach children not to lie, cheat, steal, covet, do all those things that make a mess of society. And it's clear from what we see around our country today that a lot of that has gone down the tube. Because a lot of people are thinking, I deserve a free ride. They have not been taught. And the family is in real difficulty. As you heard earlier, what's been happening, divorce rates are up, marriage rates are down, illegitimacy rates are up, all these things. And as those things happen, the family structure is disintegrating. And the more that happens, the more uh, civil disobedience, if you will, the more that happens. Consider, if you will, the government school system where many children are now and have and will be taught. What principles are they being taught? Now consider those youngsters in 10 years making laws. Now what will your job look like in the Utah legislature? That will be scary. You think your job's hard now? What will it be like then? So let me encourage you. Look at your families, other people you know. My guess out of 100 people, there are three people you know that would be interested in actually doing something, not just, uh, go back to sleep. We need to find those people. 
which is say, you, you need to find those people because we need more pullers at the oars. I hope when my time on this earth is done that I will be remembered like Bert Smith. That people remember with my children, grandchildren, and friends that I know, they will think of Dave Jorgensen as someone who was involved, who had some impact, it did something worthwhile, and might have been an example to follow. So I just want to encourage you. Thank you for being here, for spending your time. It's not easy. One last thought. Are there any bishops here? Any past LDS bishops? Anybody used to? You? Anybody else? You? Anybody else? Wants two? Several? Okay. Let me ask you. Am I correct? Average hours a week the bishop spends about 40 hours a week. 40 hours? 30 or 40? A lot, right? When you were called to be the bishop, did you have 40 hours just hanging around? <laughs> where, where did you find those 40 hours? You had, to, you, had to, what, you had to give up some things, right? Things that were probably not very important. And this is the issue. We filled our lives with so much stuff, we don't have time for things that are important. So maybe look at this as a calling, would you please? <laughs> Call you to be a laborer in the, in the vineyard here, fine 10 hours a week. Now the legislature's coming up. When I went there um, last year, I spent, what, six days up there. Marianne put me to work, I went up. I read bills. Some are disgusting. They're hard to understand. I talked to legislators, went to committee meetings, I wrote notes, did all those fun things. I spent what, six days, and you think, well, I'm older, I've got, I'm still working. I'm still working. Every day I'm working. So I'm encouraging you now, go spend time with Eagle Forum at the legislature. Go to those meetings, talk to those legislators, and make your influence felt. Find just five hours a week. Will that do? Thank you very much. I very much appreciate being here with you and for your time spent and for the things that you've done.